welcome everybody uh, to the podcast speaking our peace uh, that is p e a c t and today with us is our uh, very dear uh, professor uh, mr sudeep sinha uh, who has been my professor in my masters and he has taught me uh, gandhian ideas in educational settings and also he has been working immensely in with gandhian ideas uh, since very long so i would just like to introduce you to sujit sinha and i would love if uh, sujit sinha uh, talks about himself uh, for a bit i am sujit sinha i am now 64 years old so basically uh, my schooling and college happened in the 1970s so um, so when i was in high school you know the 1960s students turmoil all over the world uh, talking about peace anti nuclear movements um, this was uh, kind of strong but uh, i was i was also small at that time by the time i was finishing high school that was early 1970s uh, but the winds of the 1960s uh movement was still there a little bit but when i was growing up in eastern india and often going to the city of calcutta that was also the time of naxalite movement which was a very violent ultra left movement which believed in violence in violent overthrow of the capitalist state but somehow uh, although many of my generation or people slightly older than me and even my age did join the naxalite movement those who were in calcutta i was not living in calcutta my father was in a state of assam but i used to come to calcutta quite often somehow in my mind um, that violence did not appeal to me at all so i could understand why the naxalite movement but somehow it seemed to me that this violence is not the solution now this is the time when i hadn't read any gandhi yeah. i mean people of my generation everyone were given this you know lectures on gandhi gandhi was in school textbook somewhere but we never seriously engaged with gandhi at that time but i think temperamentally i was not um, enamored by violence ever so later on when i uh, started engaging with gandhi more seriously it immediately appealed to me in in my bsc 1974 75 within all that turmoil i came across this book by this author called aldous huxley call ends and means uh. and in some sense that was the turning point in my life because i was not getting this intellectual churning from my friends or from my uh, classmates in college there the discussion was very vague and very you know but when i read aldous huxley's ends and means i learned about gandhi and then gradually i started reading not systematically but some interest in gandhi and peace non violence you know because that is a major thing in aldous huxley's ends and means so by the time i went to iit kanpur i didn't know what to do vaguely rural development interested in gandhi but i have no idea what to do so um some at some point i don't know how now i can't remember this idea entered my head that maybe i should become a school teacher oh why school teacher so my argument was that most of india even then is rural and for me for the foreseeable future majority is going to be rural now i started arguing that a small percentage of rural children will migrate out and come to cities which is fine but the majority will not majority will stay back in the rural but more and more of them are going to school 
and what is their curriculum their curriculum is the same curriculum as i study in a city that you were thinking when you were in masters when in my masters i started thinking ki hmm. why should they be studying the same thing if they are going to stay in the rural yeah or in other words where is rural in the school curriculum it True. is not there and i had never studied and so a rural child sitting in this 600000 villages of india they were also not studying about their own villages it was a standard curriculum and at that time i was not arguing like this but maybe somewhere vaguely it was there that the whole purpose of school i hadn't read iman elich or gandhi at that time so i i was but in my mind it seemed the purpose of school was to fit you into an urban industrial society that was the purpose of school so i am arguing that you know so maybe if i go to a rural school and start thinking about what will be an alternative curriculum for people who are not going to migrate to urban areas but whose idea is to build a wonderful village so that people are not trying to escape a village but people are saying this is a beautiful place to live in where is that curriculum where is that school curriculum so now by by the time it is 1978 i am in my i finished my first year in msc masters in iit kanpur yeah. now i i am become very strong in my mind yes this is what i want i want to become a village school teacher but i had this sense also that if i go to a village in west bengal and start telling this idea people are either going to laugh at me or they are going to get very angry with me and throw me out no one is going to listen to yeah. so what do i do where do i say all this and then this idea started occurring to me where people are not so much invested in this industrial civilization there if i tell them about the dangers of industrial civilization and ask them that can we together think about an alternative in rural areas maybe they'll listen to me and what would be that area i thought that would be tribal area if i go to remote indigenous villages where they are still not hooked to mainstream development idea yes. then maybe we can have a discussion and maybe in those schools we can start having a different curriculum 1979 i'm just about to finish my masters in arunachal pradesh there was a residential ramakrishna mission school for tribals and i knew about it because i grew up close to that in this town called duliajan which was the headquarters of this public it was a joint sector company called oil india limited where my father was a chief chemist now this particular company is very much in the news for the last two months because there has been a terrible blowout a well has exploded and oil is spewing out and environment and people's lives are getting devastated that is the place where i grew up i did my schooling and i knew about this tribal school in arunachal pradesh which was about 50 kilometers from the town where i used to live so i wrote to them saying that i would like to become a teacher and these are my ideas. i wrote in great detail as to what i was thinking so the principal of the school ramkrishna mission sadhu he wrote back saying wow this is what we want this is what swami vivekananda wanted so why don't you come and join and we anyway need teachers with a masters degree we don't have any because next year we are going to start class 11 oh. till now the school was till 10 11 now there was a bit of trouble regarding me joining that school but eventually in 1979 july i finished my masters in iit kanpur and i straight away went to arunachal pradesh and joined this school so broadly the idea was that uh, from an appropriate class where students start learning sciences and social studies they would study their own villages their own area their own history their own society their own economy uh, if they are studying biology they learn about their own flora and fauna to start with you know those yeah. kind of things so you know the school started and students came in and i had never taught before so i'm getting into the group uh, ncrt it was a cbsc board ncrt books so i'm figuring out how to teach chemistry 
maths physics because they had did not have enough teachers so oh. i would i ended up teaching chemistry from class 7 till 11 sometimes physics maths and so I, it was very packed to start with you know i didn't have time to think about anything i'm a new teacher i'm trying to figure out how to teach connecting laboratories and so on and so forth yeah and then there is this ncert syllabus and you wanted to do something else also in this school yeah yeah <laughs> I, and the school was very proud because the first batch of class 10 students who had finished and who had come for class 11 they had all got first divisions in class 10 oh. so there was a kind of pressure on the teachers to see to it that the second batch also everyone gets first division <laughs> and that the 11 12 results are also very good and so on and so forth but after 6 months i started talking about my ideas and then ncert had sent a manual of work education Oh wow! And At that time, like 1980s, yeah, 1979, right? Ah. So the work education and the principal gave me the manual. Said, "Sujit, here it is. Why don't you read it? And maybe you will find some ideas of what you wanted to do." So I excitedly read the whole manual in two, three days, and I found it quite good. And I felt that some of the ideas that I have been talking about, there is a scope of doing them. Mm-hmm. So I thought about it. what are the various things that we can do as projects as science projects as social science projects and uh, there was a monthly meeting of teachers all the staff used to meet so the principal told me why don't you present your ideas so in that monthly meeting i started saying some of the things that we could do and yeah. the principal stopped me the principal said what are you talking about i said why you know these are there in some form in this ncert project book he said no but where is the time we have to do well in exams so students have to study hard no no we can't do all that and he said i have a suggestion and he gave some absolutely garbage suggestion but i was young you know i'm just fresh out of college and i've gone with these ideas to the schools yeah so i completely lost my temper i remember i got up and started shouting at the principal so there was a lot of tension in the staff meeting because i was also a wonderful catch as a teacher yeah. i came from this elite iit kanpur institution i was a masters and they had very few masters teachers so they couldn't throw me out mm-hmm. which is what the school would do if any teacher disagreed they would just kick him out yeah yeah they would kick me out and so i shouted and the principal said that okay okay why don't you uh, give some concrete proposals but the long and short of it is that nothing happened so i realized in the next 2 3 months that i cannot fight that system and i'm young and this principal is very cunning mm. and then i also realized that the central government and the arunachal government because lot of dignitaries and uh, would keep on visiting that school almost every week Oh. and uh, uh, so from the center from the state ias officers ministers and they would address the students and i realized that this these residential schools in arunachal pradesh were set up with the purpose that arunachal should not follow nagaland and mizoram in oh. terms of insurgents trying to get away from india fight for some kind of freedom so these schools were a ground of taking in good students good tribal students yeah making them get good results then getting good jobs so a kind of elite would be created within this tribal society who were all in mainland india mainstream india but they were also tribals so the political purpose behind these schools was that they be india yeah now i was not interested in that mm. my purpose was to create a different model a different kind of civilization different kind of society yes and uh, i realized that i cannot fight this battle so within a year i i quit so 1980 um, i joined in 1979 i quit in 1980 after finishing one academic year and then i didn't know what to do even at that time i hadn't heard the word ngo that there were organizations which were involved in rural development i had no idea and none of us had any idea at that time so yeah. as a default i went away to us to do a phd in chemistry 
when in usa at that time the only indian magazine which used to come to the library was something called india today oh <laughs> and there sometimes i read some articles about you know a health ngo jamkhet district in maharashtra dr arole oh and then some other such news would start appearing and i started thinking wow what is this <laughs> and so you know there i was in us doing a phd in chemistry and i started hearing the word appropriate technology and then i heard that there were people in india trying to develop appropriate technologies so in princeton university where i had gone for phd i found out that there was an appropriate technology division so i walked over and started talking to them and said can i move from chemistry to this department and the person there who told me that sujit if you really want to do appropriate technology for india and rural india you should go back to india <laughs> don't sit in princeton and try to do rural appropriate technology for india so he said look you finish your chemistry phd and then you think what you want to do after 1986 when i had finished my postdoc i came back to india i joined this ngo in 1987 who were doing all kinds of rural development work you know typically sustainable agriculture preventive health a little bit of education and so on and so forth uh, i joined them and then gradually a bunch of local boys and girls they sort of persuaded me that why don't we form a separate organization of our own and we did that in 1988 we formed our own organization and then that old idea of mine that can we have a different rural curriculum yeah. that again sprang up in <laughs> 1990 early 90s i was busy with this rural youth setting up our organization you know typically you try to get funds you start small small things uh, you try to get your local activist trained so gradually we formed a sustainable agriculture group a health group an education group we started pre primary schools we started experimental primary schools and oh. in 1996 97 i again went back to my original idea of working with adolescents so mm -hmm. typically class 5 6 7 8 9 students and this see if a different kind of curriculum could be designed what we did was because we could not enter schools government schools so in villages we formed this adolescent groups and we mm -hmm. call them kishor kishori vahinis wow. so in eight villages we formed this groups and with these kids during weekends uh, when they had little bit of time and much during summer vacations and during their durga puja vacations which is long in west bengal we started doing all kinds of activities with them and we kept on increasing one activity after another as we went along now 90s was also the period when i had started reading gandhi again not very systematically but at least his education ideas and then tagore right oh, yeah bengali i had no being a bengali you read tagore's poems and songs and stories but that tagore had written a huge amount of things on rural development and his own educational experiment i hadn't read much so i started reading them and then this idea started gelling into my head that village youths should study the village and should be trying to solve the problems of the villages at that time uh, already some amount of uh, awareness about environment biodiversity was increasing so they should also do this kind of environmental studies so every year we would start some new practical activity with the children so for example Uh, one of the activities was whether they could disinfect all their drinking water sources because they themselves said that they have a lot of health issues and one of the main issues is all kinds of stomach issues yeah right diarrhea this and that so can the village youths disinfect all the drinking water sources of the village mm. and how do you do some surveys how do you collect data from the village how do you analyze it how do you use your math skills then it turned out that these village youths mostly from poor families many of them from landless families 
so they belonged to families who did not have their own farm who were landless laborers so they were very poor but almost all of them in that area have country chicken oh. as a backup economic insurance yes and a lot of this country chicken die because of diseases mm -hmm. so then discussion on uh, can these country chicken be immunized but it's very expensive and there are no veterinary doctors so can the children do it and the children were initially scared but we taught them and then they started immunizing the country chicken of the whole village and oh. that such a stunning work for them and also learning in the process yeah, how so old were they they were uh, you know 11 12 13 14 15 years of age so you know injecting they were very scared first how can we injection yeah and that too like very fragile chicken yeah yeah i mean they became expert at it they would so i remember they would form a group so seven eight kids and they would go to a particular hamlet let's say with 30 40 houses and announce that tomorrow morning we are going to come and immunize all the chicken so please so what households would do early morning they would release the chickens right and chicken <laughs> would then move around these are country chicken every yeah. family has 10 or 12 but before releasing they would catch this chicken two people and one person would give the injection initially the adults wouldn't believe it you know they were laughing hey these children what can they do they are saying all this. but they were amazed you know these children this and the mortality of the country chicken just went down in those villages there yeah. were hardly any deaths after that so then one by one we started talking about agriculture we taught them how to make nurseries then how to do grafting of fruit trees yes. um, then how to make herbal medicine how to do simple food processing of things which were grown excess in their area and would spoil mm -hmm. so but not everything in one year every year we would introduce one or two new activities and then their stock of activities which they did kept on increasing but there was also a lot of singing dancing wow. so these adolescent groups we taught them theater we taught them puppetry <laughs> and we taught them a lot of folk dances from bengal from so we had staff we had about 10 staff and these staff they would always keep a lookout of if any dance group was coming to calcutta if any this and they were sir sujit can we go and learn from them can you ask them whether they can teach us wow. so these people uh, by 2003 4 these youth groups in any village could entertain you for 4 hours at a stretch <laughs> you know they would sing and dance and theater and puppetry and so wow. there was a bit of local demand for these children if there was an adult function they would say hey why don't you ask them to come and inaugurate or start the program with something so this these various things you know cleaning the village collaborating with the primary health center collaborating with the block veterinary officer holding camps for cow diseases in the village and then there was another bigger ngo in calcutta whom i knew quite well and their founder is a very well known permaculture trainer called ardhendu chatterjee yeah. and he also he and his wife they also worked with adolescent group and so they came up with this series of studies to be done by youths in four different districts of west bengal and they would coordinate it so they would produce some draft lesson plans which would go out and uh, youth would do it and their teachers would come and report what they did what they couldn't do what was difficult and they would modify it and as a result of that that organization started publishing books and i think even today in india if you talk about environmental practical education they are some of the best books in india and they produce 10 books over 10 years on wow. issues like water soil rice vegetables birds insects local market you know all waste so yeah. in these and books from each these youths, like these huh? books were these books were designed from the youth from the youth so yeah. the, a draft plan then the youth would do things and then the final uh, lesson plan would be made and in those book there are lots of charts and pictures and this they are all real charts and pictures which the children have done in the village so wow. you will find the caption this is done by children of such and such village so anyway um, so this i was working till 2009 so for 20 years i was involved in rural development and uh, our organization did many things like agriculture health women self help groups trying to strengthen local government 
but my favorite work in a sense was this working with adolescent group and to think of a future school curriculum where children would be actually solving their local problems and studying the subjects through that so around 2006 local government schools invited us to start taking environment education there was a supreme court judgment saying environment should be taught compulsorily in schools so various states did it in a different manner west bengal started a separate subject and a separate book and then teachers didn't have principals did not have any idea who will teach it how they will teach then they said ki hey you guys anywhere do all this right outside the school so why can't yeah. you do it inside the school so our staff all entered this government school and from about 2007 till 2013 14 they worked in about 20 government schools it was not very easy you know given the school structure and the timetable and the exam <laughs> and so yeah. on and so forth and opposition by other teachers and so on. but within the schools our workers were able to introduce some things so for example one of the things that they did was teach them how to make a very intensive organic home garden right so what we did was we taught them the techniques in the school mm-hmm. that this is how you make compost this is how you make liquid compost this is how you do multi tier cropping this is how you do mixed cropping you know? this is how you make a bed now go home and do it mm. so children would learn here and go home and do it yeah. and to some extent that worked out in in many places right there were we did very interesting things like peer to peer evaluation like so <laughs> we could because any high school has students from 15 or 16 villages which are far away so yes. teacher cannot go running around seeing what is happening so we did said the neighboring village children would go to this village other village and see <laughs> how the kitchen gardens are doing wow so interesting ideas were there and it worked out to some extent very nicely but around 2008 9 i was thinking that you know i have worked for rural development for 20 years and i'm by that time you know country wide so many things are happening things in some senses are getting worse mm-hmm. environmental problem has become huge but the other issues also the political problems the social problems so things are so ngo movement is also becoming bigger but problems are also becoming bigger so i'm thinking what should i do now i have yeah. worked 20 years in this corner of west bengal only okay i'm part of some state level networks and i do conduct some training for other ngo staff also but i na- at the national level i am not involved so much then i thought maybe i should go and teach in the university now Uh, where rural development is taught or development studies but i didn't know much i knew about tis of course yes but uh, where else to go now at that time a new university called bihar central university had come up in mm-hmm. bihar and i heard that the coordinator of a development program was someone who was in the ngo sector and i knew him mm-hmm. so i made up a cv of mine and i wrote to him saying that will they consider me and immediately answered back saying sujit the no no because you don't your degree you have a phd but it's in chemistry you must have a degree in social science or in development oh. to be considered for a government university development <laughs> department job so okay we can't take you and then i vaguely knew that a university called azim prem ji university was coming up so i said maybe i'll apply there so i applied and i was very soon there was a phone call saying can you come for interview and they hired me and i told them about bihar central university that they hadn't taken me he said <laughs> we don't care because we see that you have worked for 20 years in rural development yes. and anyway you have some phd so that is good enough for us so you know in azim prem ji university they used to call two types of faculty academic faculty and practitioner faculty so i was considered as their first practitioner faculty <laughs> yeah when the first batch came in in 2011 core courses first year so i had i didn't have much to contribute there because i'm not a social scientist and you know the courses are all on sociology political science philosophy economics and so on and so forth, ecology but then they said that you can make electives mm. for the second year of the masters program and i thought then so i have read gandhi and tagore in a very haphazard manner why don't i offer a course called gandhi tagore and the relevance today yeah. and they said yes go ahead 
and for the first time in my life also i started studying very systematically you know trying to design a course trying to read lot of stuff and i really enjoyed myself but while reading i realized that i cannot become a gandhi or tagore scholar it's too late in life yes so what so do i do i'm not going to you know this requires 30 40 years of scholarship to become a gandhi scholar i don't have that time so i decided that maybe in a development course it is much more important to think about their relevance today and therefore i have to understand the spirit of what gandhi and tagore were saying i don't have to read all that they have written and all that others have written about them and then to see how do you apply those ideas to it and i started searching what is gandhian in the various alternatives throughout the world not just in india throughout the world and i had some very nice assistants and we together started compiling a list and i made a huge list of 40 45 things so we had 35 students and i told them you each of you pick up one topic and write a term paper and present it in the class now these were topics on which i didn't know much i had some vague idea <laughs> and this first batch of students did a wonderful job yeah. they wrote these term papers and they presented them in class and there were a lot of discussions and all those term papers became my raw material for the subsequent courses yeah. so in azim prem university you know i taught uh several courses gandhi tagore and their relevance for a few years and then i started teaching a course called work and education so by the time i was thinking more and more about nai taleem gandhi's educational ideas tagore's ideas i started visiting anand niketan school in sevagram started yes. learning about the various alternative schools which had tried something gandhian nai taleem but nai taleem had also vanished and trying to understand historically so this work and education i taught for a semester and then i split it into two courses one mm-hmm. called nai taleem which is gandhi's education idea in school level other called vocational education which is you know at the high school and college level and these two courses i taught for uh, several years and by this time my young colleague pallavi had joined and so we together designed these courses by the time in 2017 i was thinking that we need another kind of course Mm-hmm. which is more futuristic which talks about much more daring experiments which are going on all over the world which are anti industrialism so by the time i had also started formulating in my mind uh, so how do we look at modern civilization and i tended to agree with people who desire define it as an industrialism and they would say capitalism and socialism both are part of industrialism mm-hmm. they are different but they are both part of industrialism so look at last 200 years of history as industrialism and it it's basic uh, philosophy and then it's full politics it's society it's education it's technology it's economic the whole thing together and then i also started reading what ashish kothari of kalpavriksh pune was writing and then i asked him that can we together design a course which is talking about these futuristic but they already are there somewhere in the world mm-hmm. and we came up with this uh, name called living utopias but then in 2018 i fell very sick so we couldn't design it so later on i and pallavi we designed this course and uh, my retirement was also coming near so i decided that i will quit after teaching this new course and from january to may 2019 i and pallavi taught this course called living utopias to the yeah. final semester students of ma development and then i quit so what i do right now is all over india i am trying to spread these stories of living utopias these fantastic stories of people trying out alternatives in various parts of the world and in india and we have delivered this living utopia course twice in the university as a semester course and four times outside the university in a six day intensive mode in which you have also participated yeah i was in the first batch in muniguda in, oh you were in muniguda right first batch 
so we have done it four times now and currently i'm doing it with several all india groups not as a full course but one or two stories at a time going deep into it and trying to see whether out of these stories they will be able to implement some of these ideas in their areas that, that is what i'm doing and one of the toughest thing is that when you are conducting these so called classes or discussion with village level activists those mm -hmm. who have not had lot of formal education who mm -hmm. and then we are facing the issue that how do you tell these stories how what words do you use because certain words that i use with you and with other people you know what that means yeah. but yeah. but those who have not been through formal education they're not familiar with those words and then if you talk about a foreign story sometimes they don't even know what country you are talking about what culture you are talking about and on top of that the whole course has to be delivered in the vernacular and we are so used to doing everything in english our yes. materials are in english our print material our audio visuals are in english so one of the biggest tasks which i and pallavi we are trying to do now is how to make these things into vernacular and how to contextualize them so that a village youth can also understand and get excited and say hey i'm going to try out this idea wow that's nice sir so by now everybody must be knowing that sujit is a fabulous storyteller <laughs> and so i would really request uh, sujit to just tell us one story of these living utopias uh, examples which is his favorite so very briefly uh, there are these people called amish in us yes now um the, in some senses they are really amazing because these amish people are a christian sect who were persecuted in europe and migrated to us now at some point they decided that they are not going to accept many of the things which are the basic things of industrial civilization or industrialism and they decided that we'll have some criteria we will use that particular criteria to judge whether we should take something new or not as a result of that and as a massive churning over last 100 years there are these 2000 communities in us not just 20 30 or 40 there are 2000 villages spread all across us which do not use electricity mm -hmm. they are they are not remote they are living just next to cities right they yeah. do not use electricity therefore no electric bulbs mixers vacuum cleaners refrigerators tv radio nothing mm -hmm. right they decided they're not going to use automobile so no cars motorcycles nothing they have their horse cart plowing with horse plowing yeah they have decided that they are not going to use so they do not like to be photographed they wear very simple clothes by default they do only organic farming mm -hmm. they by default their businesses are all small they yeah. mix with they sell they have uh, so can you imagine a, a society living today in, in us the heart of uh, the highest consumerist society in the world and which worships individualism and here are these villages which consume so little are not at all individualistic they are very communitarian and they are healthier and happier than the american people so this is one of the stories we see we show a film on them so mm. when when people most people have never heard about them and when they see this they are absolutely flabbergasted that such a thing can exist in the world yeah right? so there are many stories like this many indian stories also we tell them and then we have discussions as to whether this is possible and yeah so on this point sir i just want to come to the maybe last uh, question because uh, gandhi and tagore has both like talked about creating a alternative uh, society and a beautiful world and lot of things from a smallest beautiful is coming in there and what we talked about amish also so what do you think these ideas of peace and non violence like really get built in in these kind of societies when you you have worked in those rural areas and you can have worked with the students so both 
with respect to Gandhi and Tagore, they were very clear in their mind that industrialism itself is violence. Mm-hmm. Industrialism is about perpetual material growth by extracting more and more faster and faster from nature yeah. through the nation state and through this huge corporate companies mm-hmm. right each of this is violent yeah each of this is violent when you are trying to extract more and more from nature perpetually this is violent this is not only violence on nature this is violence on each other on other animals and therefore the way i see it is as long as you are hooked to industrialism as long as you don't reject that you cannot fight violence you cannot have peace and non violence so that is a must and therefore according to me the way i understand gandhi and tagore nation state itself is violent so sometimes i say in my course also the age of nation state is over modern nation state has existed only for 200 years it is violent it has got to be violent because its main task is promoting industrialism if you or i go against industrialism and try to talk about a different model then you are actually threatening nation state and all the forces of the nation state are going to jump on you the existing political parties the bureaucracy the judiciary no one is going to like you because you are raising a fundamental question you are questioning <laughs> their existence but yeah. then what are gandhi and tagore saying they are talking about a completely different world which gandhi defined as oceanic circles right and nowadays there is talked about talk about post nationalism so if you want peace if you want non violence you have to think about a frugal society frugal society because just increasing your material wealth how can you have non violence how can you have peace a frugal society and a society where no one accumulates power because that is another problem if you design society as a huge pyramid mm-hmm. of power then there's go always going to be violence so therefore you have to design society horizontally which is gandhi's way of saying oceanic circles where neither wealth nor power can get concentrated then only you can talk about peace and non violence yeah i i just want uh, sir sudeep sir uh, you to tell something to our young people and uh, like they have heard so much from you now like whole journey even the details of it how you started but what do you want to say to them who are starting their journeys now in these times when things yeah. are really so i i i won't say too much i will give one of my most favorite quote which you have students have heard from me and this is a quotation of bernard shaw who says you see things and ask why but i dream things that never were and i say why not so to young people i would say you have to dream of a world which consists of just equitable healthy happy peaceful creative caring sharing loving self sufficient self governing eco sustainable non exploiting communities rural and urban communities and that young people should form groups should form peer groups to see whether they can in various ways either directly or indirectly strive for such communities and not nation states and these communities will build up gradually yeah so we should all feel one as jadavar said uh we know how we said about the whole whole world to be one and uh, with that we were walking and i think a lot of people walking in different corners of the world and as sudeep said we have to make more and experiment more and dream more uh with that note i'll take your leave uh thank you so much for being with us and being with sudeep thank you so much sudeep sir